When the nation needed a leader to take his people into the promised land, God had already prepared a new leader, a man that had learned from the previous leader, a man after God's heart. A man with a totally different skill set and a different style, one who was ready and set for this very moment. This is a story about new leadership. This is a story about a courageous new leader. This is a story about a courageous nation. This is a story about God's plans and it involves us. This is Joshua, the call to be courageous. So do you feel courageous this morning? Yes. Let me see your, show me your war face. Okay. Let's try this side. Show me your war face. Uh, okay, I got one for one. There's something about being courageous that has to manifest on the outside as well. There's something about when we call to be courageous that something has to shift in the way we actually behave. We cannot be called to be courageous but not have it manifest in the way we behave and the way we respond. We're called to be courageous. We, we're working through the book of Joshua which speaks about, and it's this whole thing where the, the, Moses is dead, Joshua's taken over, he's leading the people. There's something about this transition that's taking place. There's a transition that's taking place in this church. So we're using it as kind of a, a mirror, as a reference of what does a transition look like? What can it look like when God's in it? And we know God's in it, so what is it supposed to look like? We're supposed to manifest. What, if we say this is a call to be courageous, this is a book challenging us on our courage. Are we courageous? Are you convinced? Yes. Then tell your mouth and make a noise. Are you courageous? Yes. At least fake it until you make it at this stage. I, I love the story of this Joshua because it's all, it just, Joshua leads so differently to Moses. Joshua is so radically different to Moses. Moses was for a season, Joshua is for the next season. That's the whole point of the story. That's why God's put it in the Bible. Because all leadership transition has to be from one style to a different style. Because if it's the same thing, then it's... I know a lot of my friends are going to listen to the sermon online. And they are pastors in other churches. And they are listening to it. And I'm going to make the statement and they're going to get upset. And I'm all right with it. But if the transition is one leader to the other and the leaders are the same kind of people, the transition is not from God. It has to be different, else God can keep the original there. The, the Moses season was done for the Israelites. It had to become a Joshua season. Mo, uh, Moses was really old, I get that. But there's something that will in the next season has to look different. We, we find ourselves in the book of Joshua, is they've just crossed over the Jordan River. Now, this is not the Val River where if you find a lacquer spot, you can walk over. This is not a stream. I've got a picture of what the river looks like in the month of Nisan. And this is the month that they cross over in. That's the river when it flows in the month that they're crossing over in. It's a torrential, uh, it, 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 it's a torrential downpour of all this water from Mount Hebron that it flows down. And what it does, it collects. And when the river's flowing, it is impossible to cross over. That's the thing. A transition is impossible to go from one side to the other side if God's not in it. And you'd have heard last week is God stops this water flowing and the priests go out and the, the Israelites cross over onto the other side. I want to look at it this morning and I want to see what it looks like. And once we cross over, what does it look like on the other side? I've got th After the sermon, I've got two sermons left in this house. Two more left. If you'll let me make them count, I want your big ears on this morning. Let me make it count. Let's pray and open and dedicate this time to our King as I preach. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name. I don't want to be a clanging symbol. I want to represent the kingdom well. I want to express your love. I want to express your heart. I want to work through this text so that our lives are changed afterwards, that we're different afterwards because the word has been spoken. What a privileged era we live in where we get to have the word read to us, where we get to read the word ourselves, where we have access to the, the letter, the love letter from heaven. I pray, Lord, this morning, open our hearts and our minds and our ears to hear what it is that the Spirit of God is saying to us in Joshua chapter 4, verse 1, in Jesus' name. Amen. When all the nation had finished passing over the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, I'm going to read, this, I'm going to read the whole lot of text, and I'm going to pull a whole lot of stuff out. Once I've pulled a whole lot of stuff out, we're going to go home. We good? Okay. When all the nation, say with me, all the nation, all the nation. 
all the nation had finished passing over the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, take 12 men from the people, from each tribe a man, and command them, saying, take 12 stones from here, out of the midst of the Jordan, from the very place where the priest's feet stood firmly, bring them over with you, and lay them down in the place where you lodged tonight. So where the priests were standing, and the Jordan River is now dry, go and get these 12 stones. Then Joshua called the 12 men from the people of Israel, whom he had appointed, a man from each tribe. And Joshua said to him, Pass on before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan, and take up each of you a stone upon his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the people of Israel, this, that this may be a sign among you. When your children ask in time to come, what do those stones mean to you? Then you shall tell them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it passed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall be to the people of Israel a memorial forever. And the people of Israel did just as Joshua commanded, took up the 12 stones out of the midst of the Jordan, according to the number of the tribes of the people of Israel, just as the Lord told Joshua. They carried them over with them to the place where they lodged and laid them down there. And Joshua set up 12 stones in the midst of the Jordan in the place where the feet of the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant had stood. And they are, here, or they are there to this day. For the priests bearing the Ark in the midst of the Jordan until everything was finished that the Lord commanded Joshua to tell the people according to all that Moses had commanded Joshua. The people passed over in haste. It has to be sudden. If it's delayed, it's a problem. When all the people had finished passing over the ark of the Lord and the priests passed over before the people, the sons of Reuben and the sons of Gad and half the tribe of Manasseh passed over armed before the people of Israel as Moses had told them. About 40,000 ready for war passed over before the Lord for battle to the plains of Jericho. On that day, the Lord exalted Joshua in the sight of all Israel and they stood in awe of him just as they stood in awe of Moses all the days of his life. The Lord said to Joshua, command the priests bearing the ark of the testimony to come up out of the Jordan. So Joshua commanded the priests come up out of the Jordan. And when the priests bearing the ark of the covenant of the Lord came up from the midst of the Jordan and the soles of their feet were lifted up on dry ground, the waters of the Jordan returned to their place and overflowed all its banks as before. Are you with me with this picture? The water's not flowing. The priests are standing there. God says to Joshua, Get people from the tribe, not the priests. Get people. Get the people. The people are serving as part of this incredible moment. Get the people who represent the people to come and get the stones. And they go and pack the stones out as a memory of what's going to take place. And as they bring the Ark of the Covenant through, and as the priests leave, the priests step out on, with dry feet. They step out, through the, out of the Jordan. And all of a sudden, there's this flow, and the river flows again. Then the people came up out of the Jordan on the 10th day of the first month, and they encamped at Gilgal on the east border of Jericho. And these 12 stones which they took out of the Jordan, Joshua set up at Gilgal. And he said to the people of Israel, when your children ask their fathers in times to come, what do these stones mean? Then you shall let your children know, Israel passed over this Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan for you until you passed over as the Lord God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up for us until we passed over. So that all the peoples of the earth, that all the peoples of Secunda, all the peoples of the Tex area may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty, that you may fear the Lord your God forever. Joshua has taken over the leadership of Israel and he's doing something extraordinary. Signs and wonders are taking place. There's this incredible moment. It's ridiculous. We read the Bible as though we're reading a bedtime story, but we're supposed to be reading it as this incredible revelation of what happened then. It's not a story. It's not a parable. It's not an idea. It's not philosophy. It's not ideology. It's the perfect word of God telling us a historical fact where God did something ridiculous and he does it again and again and again. And we need to read it with a present day understanding that what he did then, he wants to do now. So my sermon today is called A Courageous Journey because we can all start off strong, but we need to stay strong through the journey. So I want to speak. So they had these 12 stones, these 12 stones that they erected and set up in memory of this transitioning from one side of the Jordan, from the west side to the east side. So I want to talk about the 12 stones of transition this morning. The 12 stones of what we learn. And it's not just about the church transition, but it applies to your everyday life. First one, everyone crossed over. Everyone crossed over. No one gets left behind. No one is insignificant. No one is, no one is 
regarded as being useless. There's not a single person sitting here this morning that does not feature, that does not matter. We can apply it to the transition of the church. It's fine. But have you as a born-again Christian fully transitioned from your previous life into your new life? How many of you as Christians does your new life, being born again in Christ, look exactly like your old life before you knew Christ? Well, I know Jesus, but I still carry on living my life as though in full immorality, entertaining the addictions, carrying on as though I want to. Do you continue living your life like you always did? Or have you completely transitioned? Because I'm just a witness that some people are standing on this side of the Jordan and this side of the Jordan, and the Jordan is not made to be straddled. You're going to get washed away, and that's what the enemy wants to do. I'm not saying go back. I'm saying, have we fully crossed over to live the life that God has called us to live? Or are we living a little bit in the past? We often speak about living in the past when it comes to Moses. He brings the Israelites out of Egypt. We always speak about, did they fully leave Egypt or is Egypt still left in them? We're speaking about sin and their past existence. But I'm speaking about even now. Well, you might be born again, you might be living a life in Christ, but your life still resembles. We cannot look like we used to look. I'm not talking appearances, but I've seen people get born again. They look different as well. I'm, I'm talking about people that you've, you've had an encounter with Jesus, so your lifestyle changes. Not because you're forcing it, but because you're allowing Christ to work in you and through you and something happens. Your morality is different. Not because Christ came to make us moral. Christ came to make dead men alive. But is there something that has shifted? Have we fully crossed over into our new lives? Or have we just mastered the splits where we can keep one foot on both sides? Amen. Give me something, people. I know I'm challenging you. But at least smile. You should never have to tell people you're a Christian. Your lifestyle should scream it. Let me tell you this. Then later on in the story, I don't want to give the plot away, but you can go read the script. It's all waiting there. But Joshua and the team, they go take on Jericho. They decimate the place. I think one of the reasons why Jericho was overrun, besides God pushing the walls in, they were still soldiers. The, the walls were there to stop a random fight. They had seven days to prepare because the Israelites are marching around the walls of Jericho. How did the Israelites still have victory? And I believe it's because the the folk in Jericho would have seen the Israelites on the other side of the river and they would have said, well, they can't cross, so we're safe, at least for the rainy season. And then they supernaturally transition into the new season and it catches the enemy of God. The problem is we're looking at it going, well, I still continue with all my life, my old life, and I'm challenging on your sexuality. Can we do that? We still allowed? Do I have to be politically correct? I've never been before. I'm not going to start now. If you shine the light of Jesus on your relationship, is it what Jesus is calling you to live? Oh, that sounds like condemnation. No, no, it's crossing to the other side where God is calling you to live a life of purity and holiness and righteousness. But I'm going to get to that challenge now. Everyone crosses over. We're ready. Okay, for the next season, you need stones. What do I mean by this? Make memories. And I'm speaking into your life as well. We're living in the era of the most documented stuff ever. Apparently, according to a survey that I went and read, 92 million selfies are taken every day. I know some of you are taking them. I love selfies. Because the beauty thing, the beautiful, the beautiful thing about selfies, I'm always going to get the right angle. Because if a stranger takes a photo, they don't care about your double chin. Whereas you look at yourself, you're like, holy moly. I've got more chins than a Chinese telephone directory. You guys got that one. Well done. We need to live a life. I I take that selfie now in memory of the moment that I'm enjoying now so that one day when I'm speaking to, where's Caleb? 
Is he running kids on? So one day with my children, I get to say to them, this is when I did this. This is when we handed over the children, the church, when it was still small. And that's the church we read about now. We need to live a life where we're making memories with our children, not just where you went on holiday. I'm talking about sitting with your kids. Are we making memories with our kids that we can tell them, this is what God has done for me. This is the life I live. I I pack stones in my family. We do stuff together. We have memories together. We... I take photos of what we do. Then Facebook reminds me of stuff, and it's fantastic. A lot of you are probably being reminded of a thing we got together and we did a whole lot of stuff, lo- stuff last year this time. We've got to not live in the past, but live with memories of what Jesus has done. We've got to live with a mindset. I want to remember what Jesus has done, and I want to tell my kids about it. So start living a life worth telling your kids about. Do something. By the way, if you're a visitor here this morning, my name's Derek. I'm one of the pastors at Lighthouse Church. <laughs> Live a life that's worth recording. Live a life where you want to take a photo and go, this is what I do, this is what I get up to. This is, this is it. I was listening to a guy, his name's, his name's Robbie Dawkins, a guy from the States, operates all over the Middle East and that. And people make the statement, the safest place to be is in the will of God. And he says, that's the dumbest, I agree with him. He says, it's the dumbest thing a person can say. He says, because he's been arrested, he's been beaten, he's been whipped. He's been chained because of living in the will of God. The most purposeful place to be is in the will of God. Let's start living a life. We're taking photos where it's extreme, where something different, where I'm having a radical encounter with God, where I'm doing something radical for Jesus. There's a whole lot of radical stuff planned within the life of this church, where there's going to be missions and a whole lot of stuff. Sign up for it. Go and do something. You're all invited because everyone crosses over. Each tribe matters. There's a stone for each tribe. Every life group matters. Every family matters. I was asked this question 12 years ago. We had just moved to Secunda. We had moved to Secunda in December 2010. And one of the pastors in Secunda came to me and he said, if the church that you lead disappears next week, will anyone miss it? Besides the people that attend and besides the kids of the parents. And, but if the church disappeared that you lead, would anyone miss it? Would anyone in town miss the church? I mean, no. I don't think so. He said, then change that or leave. Secunda, Trichat, Ivanda, Kinross, this area, would miss Lighthouse if he disappeared tomorrow. Because every one of you matter. Make sure that you're serving and living out your call. I don't care if you've been saved for a week or for 10 years. Start living out your calling. What's your calling? Man, join, go do foundations, do gifts, you're going to figure it out. But your calling is significant. Your calling's at work, your calling's the people you study with, the, the calling is in your family, but you're called to be significant. You're called to carry the gospel of the hope of Jesus Christ. You, every one of you, you're significant. Can I ask you just to look at the person next to you? I'm watching you. Look at the person there. And just look at them and go and smile at them and say, you're significant. I promise you there's not a court in this country that would believe you. We don't say it with conviction because you're not fully convinced about it ourselves. We're not personally convinced. I'm not personally convinced that Jesus Christ wants to use me because God will use someone else. No, he's placed you here in the season for a purpose and for a plan. There's not a single family that's insignificant. Each tribe matters. Next one. Always pursue his presence. They went where the ark was. I'm not going to harp on this, but this is a value of Lighthouse Church. It's the presence of God or nothing at all. It's the presence of God. In worship, we pursue His presence. In preaching, it's in His presence. Our life groups, it's in His presence. At home, pursue the presence of God. What does the presence of God look like? It means you start pursuing peace in your homes. It means you stop having stupid arguments with your husbands. She smiles at me lovingly. (laughs) But you know the truth. Pursuing the presence of God in your home. 
what does it require that you change in your house? Maybe make those changes. The next one. Just as Joshua said, listen to your leader. They did just as Joshua said. Would you please follow your leader? Follow your life group leader. We've got people, men and women, full of the Spirit, full of Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit. They lead, they love, and they do it well. I want to read this to you in Romans 13. Obey your spiritual leaders. Do what they say. Oh. You see, too many people come to me and say, hey, D, by the way, we're leaving. And I go, gee, are you sure? Now, I'm making this de decision, we're gone. And no one bothers speaking to their leaders, their life group leaders, or to the elders and saying, would you mind praying into this with us, please? Obey your spiritual leaders, do what they say. Their work is to watch over your souls. They are accountable to God. I will stand before God one day, and I have to give account for you. And I'm not going, oh, I can't do this one anymore. Let me rather leave. For the season that we've been here, I've taken it seriously, and I will be taking it seriously as well. But so are your life group leaders. It doesn't say your pastors. It says your spiritual leaders. Life group leaders, start taking your job seriously. You will stand before God one day. You will have to answer for certain things. Make sure you're leading and loving accordingly. Give them, the leaders, reason to do this with joy and not with sorrow. That would certainly not be for your benefit. I'm asking that you will follow your spiritual leaders so that it will benefit you. Do what they say. Not a cult. You know, we're not going to look at everyone's budgets. We're not going to look at everyone's... I'm saying live a life before God that is holy and pure. But when you make decisions, when you do stuff, speak to your spiritual leaders because your spiritual leaders are watching over your souls. It doesn't say your spiritual leaders are watching over your spirit. So you go, oh, well, they're spiritual things. No, they're watching over your souls as well, your well-being, your health, your physical, your emotional, your mental stuff. No, we want to live free. We, we're free because Christ has set us free. We can do what we want. This is the problem. We then have to have meetings when you've done what you've wanted. Then we've got to come up with a creative solution to fix your problems. You're like free falling. You've jumped out of the plane. What you grabbed wasn't a parachute. It was your backpack. So you're falling out of the aircraft, eating some kid's sandwich, going, Pastor, will you help us? And we're going, what do we do? Live a life that you listen to your spiritual leaders. It's called submission. It's biblical. And the world hates it. The world hates this concept. It's accountability and responsibility. Philippians 1 verse 1 says, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi, with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe there's something of grace and peace to you when you're willing to submit to the overseers and the deacons. You see what it's saying? Paul, Timothy, apostolic oversight. To the saints, all saints, okay? And the overseers and the deacons. And he's speaking, he's saying, if you're willing to submit, and I'm reading deep into this, but this is what Paul's writing, he's going, if you're willing to understand the principle of overseers and deacons, elders and deacons, there's an element that I can declare of you, grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ. You want, I'm not saying we're the peace carriers. I'm not saying we're the answer to all your problems. But I am saying that as spiritual leaders, when you start listening to our spiritual leaders, just for oversight, just for input, just for a reference, you get to make your own decisions. There's something of a release of God's favor over a nation. I'm all right. I bounce everything I do off spiritual leaders in my life. Everything. Every decision I make, Hey guys, I'm feeling this. I speak to them. They're not in this church. I have friends in this church. I don't have spiritual oversight in the church. And I chat to the guys and I speak to them and they'll call me out on things and I say, Derek, you're being reckless. You cannot do that. Or they'll pray into things and go, we feel this is good and right before God. I challenge you. And if you just come into church and you're just sitting on a great chair every Sunday and you think you're fulfilling your destiny, friends, you're not. Six point. I'm going to fly through the next. Be ready for war. The Gadites, the Reubenites, they crossed over. 
tens of thousands of them ready for war. It's about time we start fighting for our families. Not with our families, for our families. I was disgusted, and they're going to try to play it down in the media over the next month. But I, I was disgusted to watch how they glorified the satanic in the latest Grammys. Don't go and watch it if you haven't seen it. But there's something about our children being exposed to buckets of rubbish. And I want to use a stronger word than rubbish, but I get into trouble for this stuff. But buckets of crap that the world exposes our kids to, and we need to start contending what's happening in your child's life. What are they watching? What are they listening to? What are, they, what are, they, what are you entertaining in your house with the kids? What are you allowing this stuff to take place? We need to start fighting. I love 1 Timothy 6. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. If you go to fight a good fight, it means there's potentially a bad fight as well. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called about, which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Start contending for your families. We need to start fighting for our families again. Start. I have so many examples that I can share, having traveled internationally quite a bit lately. I'm, I watch people, that, they're losing their minds. But we have the mind of Christ to make good decisions. Start contending for your families. Mom and dad, your children do not need friends. They need parents. They don't need buddies. Let them go to school and get them. And then screen them as well. Because weirdness comes in all shapes and sizes. Contend for your families. The river dried up. This is a harsh one. The river, the source, the life. If the, if the river never flowed, the Middle East would have been agriculturally dead. They can seem like a dry season in the middle of a transition. They can seem like, and I'm speaking about the church, it can feel like a dry season in the middle of the transition. But God did it before, he'll do it again. The river flowed before, it'll flow even greater. It says when it flowed again, it burst its banks. It could be in your own lives. Are you going through a dry season? Trust the God of the harvest, trust the God of the supernatural, trust the God of the miraculous, that if there was a life before, there's life to be continued. Trust God. You could be in a dry season for health. I love Thomas this morning calling the people, getting them to pray for people to be healed. That's declaring where there's a dry season for life to come. Start living in that mind. It never flowed immediately. They had to first cross over. Maybe within the life of a church, there's a new lease on life. I'm just looking at a full building. I don't know if you're going double services in June. I don't know what the plan is. I don't know what the plan is in your families. I don't know what the dry season is. But if you're willing to trust God, the God who did it before will do it again. Because he did it before, he'll do it again. Because Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. We need to stop trying to reason God. Get to know Him. Stop trying to reason how He thinks. Stop trying to reason how He operates. Stop trying to reason. We are the created. He's the creator. He's so far above us. He just wants us to understand His love. Stop trying to figure Him out. Why does he bless some ridiculously and others have got different calls and others have got different anointings? Get to spend time with our Father but start trusting him on a ridiculous level. Hein, I challenge you. I challenge you. Before all these witnesses, to start trusting him on a level that is uncomfortable. You guys get to say amen. amen. To push boundaries that were before quite solid. The banks of the river were quite set. The banks of the Jordan, go look at it. The banks of the Jordan are generally two meters high on most sides. There's some places where they've kind of worked it down. But where they crossed over two meters high, the river broke boundaries that the river had set. The Holy Spirit will break boundaries that the Holy Spirit has set. He's going to break boundaries in the life of this church. Amen. You're only allowed to clap if you're not going to spectate. Clapping is a sign that you're volunteering. Fear God. Always fear God. Fear God more than you fear the signs. Whatever it looks like, don't fear that. Fear God. Not with terror, with awe and admiration, knowing that he's got this. Tenth one, tell people about your wins. When God does stuff, tell everyone. 
Seller, I hear the weirdest stuff. You people are saying the weirdest stuff about us going. I have people wanting to ask my son-in-law if I've given him a choice in the matter. Stop sniffing whatever they're making. Tell, tell everyone about the wins. Tell everyone about the successes. Tell people about those that are being healed on a Sunday morning. Tell people about those that are being born again. Tell people out there that we have communion every Sunday. Jesus Christ loves them. And start telling them about the wins. And when that spirit of doffness comes, God, I rebuke you in Jesus' name. Stand on the spirit of stupidity. And I crush you this morning. Amen. Amen. Yeah. He'll never leave you. <laughs> he will never leave you. He'll never leave you. Not to make sure you don't sin. He'll never leave you. So when you need advice from him, speak to him. When you need an answer from him, ask him. When you need provision from him, he's there. He'll never leave you. And my last point, you must take them up. You must take up the stones. It was never asked of others to take up for others. You must take up the stones. You must take up this challenge. Lighthouse Church, it's you. It's not the front row of miracle walk workers. Because, you know, us as pastors, we, we do the impossible. Lighthouse Church is every single one of you sitting here, down there, watching online regularly. You, Lighthouse Church, we get to take this. We get to impact our city. We get to impact our nations. We get to do this. We get to transition together. This is not me and Hein. It's my family and your family. This is us. As you say, Lord God, for your kingdom, for the king, forever. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the blueprint and what a transition can look like. And we speak and declare that the river will flow greater than it flowed before. Everyone will make it through unscathed and there will be life and life in abundance in every single area. We will tell our children that we were there. We will tell our children that we witnessed the dead being raised, cancers falling out, and life in abundance. We were there when revival broke out. We were there. Well, eyes are closed now. I want to challenge you, friends, this morning. If you're sitting here and you do not know the one that saves, Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus, he came and he died for you so that you may have life in the first place. If you do not have Jesus, you have nothing. Not church, not religion, Jesus Christ. There's no other name. No other God who can save but Jesus Christ. Just his name has the power to set you free. His name rattles the heavens. I'm asking you this morning, most of you have done this, where you've publicly committed your life, received Jesus Christ as the incredible gift of our Heavenly Father. But perhaps you're sitting here this morning and you've never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You might have wandered away and you're in a bit of a lost place. You can pray with us later. I'm not speaking to you. I'm speaking to the one or the two people here this morning and you've never made Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior. I'm asking if that's you this morning, I want you to put up your hand and just wave at me. I want to see who you are. Let's keep your hand up. Well done. Is there anyone else? 